keeping it was on Kobe it. Bryant's death planned four years before it happened? In 2016, a Comedy Central cartoon named Legends of Chamberlain Heights aired an episode where Kobe Bryant died in a helicopter crash. The second prediction of Kobe Bryant's death also happened in 2000. You already know what it is. It's your boy laid back with another reaction, another review, another episode. Hey, TikTok, you up to bat. It's your boy laid back. Welcome back to my channel. Hey, two things we got to do. You got to hit that subscribe button. I'm drinking this water, but hit that subscribe button. I see a lot of y'all watching the videos that's not subscribed to the channel. Hit the subscribe button, man. But look, Elevate More 2024. Elevate More 2024. You already know what's up, man. We back with another reaction. Hey, like I always say, do your own research. Do your own research. But this one is going to be extremely interesting. These are very eye-opening and a lot of these is going to be true. A lot of these conspiracy theories are going to be proven to be true. So just stick around. You know what I'm saying? Make sure you share this with somebody that's into this type of stuff. Or, you know, just if they trying to be woke or if they just or if you want to just mess with somebody. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, let's go ahead and get into it. I ain't going to hold you up too much, man. Hey, I appreciate you guys for supporting the channel and watching the videos and coming back and supporting, man. So thank you. But... If you make it to the end of this one, you a real one for real. If you make it to the end of this one. But anyway, Fire Squad was popping. Let's get it. This is the longest true horrifying story episode. This episode is worth the time. The story took Let's place see. in Nador, Morocco in the year 2015. The okay. story was submitted by Elias. Back in 2015, Elias was an 18-year-old Moroccan Muslim that lived in Norway. Okay. One night, Elias was back in Morocco visiting family. And he stayed up late watching a movie at home till 3 in the morning. The living room was very warm. So he got up to open the window for fresh air. Okay. As he was at the window, being at the fourth floor in that building, he looks down and the street was dark and empty, but there was one man wearing black from head to toe with the hood covering his face. He wasn't sure why that man was outside at that time. He looked away, but then peeked one last time out of curiosity. When he looked at him again, the man had his hands on a building's wall. What? He was strangely just feeling the wall and out of nowhere, the man vanishes through that wall. He oh, hell no. Bro, you look outside in the middle of the night and you see somebody rubbing a wall doing the Macarena and then he just like vanishes into the wall. He rubbed his eyes in disbelief after what he just witnessed. Elias swears that there was no door in that spot. It was just physically impossible. He forgets about this after a while Forget. and then flies back to Norway. Six months later in Norway, Elias experiences his first ever sleep paralysis, mm -mm. which in Islam is known as Jathum. He vividly remembers having a conversation with a dark figure, and his mom also witnessed him speak in his sleep. He woke up after the paralysis with swollen feet and rashes all over his body. What? They rushed to the ER, and none of the doctors could diagnose what caused his body to react that way. He was finally discharged after treatment, but after that day, Elias was never the same person. Hell he nah. always acted differently. He was antisocial. He was distant from people. And his mom always told him that he needed Ruqya. A few months Man, later, they fly back to Morocco for the next holiday season. He was always against his mother's Ruqya idea. However, he decided to fight his thoughts and do it. He okay. had a cousin that was also suffering and she visited Araki in Morocco and quite exorcism. regularly. So they went together with both of their moms. When they reached, they sat down and waited for their session. Elias could hear the Raqi in the other room, mm. and he felt extremely uneasy and started to sweat. The mm. Quran recitation, the Ruqya, the sounds, made him not even want to look at that direction. He was angry. 
He went outside for a moment to gain back his senses until their turn finally reached. Mm. The Raqi called them in and started. Elias's cousin immediately started reacting horribly when the Quran started. She was screaming so loud. Elias started losing senses throughout his entire body. Whoa. He was sweating, he was unable to move, and wow. he was shouting from fear. He does pray, and he does read Quran, but he was so confused as to why he was screaming. He felt like he was being tortured. The slightest pinch from the Raqi felt like it was a knife stab. It was Ooh. very powerful, and this is where he felt a jinn's presence inside of him. Ooh. The following night was the most horrific night for Elias. For a whole week, the man was not able to sleep alone, and he mm. would get mentally abused by these demons haunting him. Hell Weeks nah. go by, Elias started getting demonic thoughts of harming his own family. He hated everyone. When he would look at his own sister, her face would seem distorted to him. He knows these beings are playing with his head. Mm. His whole life turned upside down. He would regularly think of harming his own family, but luckily, he never did. A few months later, Elias was back in Norway and life was back to normal. He was relieved that he was in a good state of mind and that what the happened? horror was over. At the time, he worked at a local grocery store. After a Christmas celebration at work, which he did not participate in, it was late at night. He was walking one of his colleagues back home from work. She was a young woman and she was scared to walk alone. Mm -hmm. After they reached outside her place, she asked him, where's that other girl that was with us? What girl? Right. Elias asked. There was no one there. It was just you and I. She swore that there was another woman with black hair, pale skin, standing next to him Ooh, the whole time, wee. staring at Elias's colleague with anger. Even Whoa. though this entity gave Elias a break, this jinn was still around, haunting everyone wow. that has intentions towards Elias. Hell nah. Hell nah, bro. I ain't messing with none of that. None of it. Ten conspiracy theories that turned out to be Is there true. A theory you Part one. That you now realize was a load of baloney. Tell us in the comments. Number ten. Roswell cover up. In the summer of 1947, an object crashed down to Earth in Roswell, New Mexico. Theories that it was an alien spacecraft have pervaded pop culture for over a half a century since. Everybody thinks that Roswell was the first sighting of a, of a UFO in the United States, and that bull roar. The U.S. Mm. Air Force claimed that the object was merely a weather balloon, only added fuel to the fire. And the conspiracy theorists were right. It was no weather balloon, and there was a cover-up. But it wasn't an alien ship either, probably. The object was a high-altitude balloon launched as part of Project Mogul. These balloons were intended to detect sound waves from Soviet atomic bomb tests. Mm. During the Cold War, the U.S. military couldn't exactly be honest about that in the papers. Now, whether you think that's another cover story, well... This better not be another damn Russian spy job. Number 9. Big Tobacco's Big Lie. There's extensive mm. use of this technology, which is called ammonia chemistry that allows for nicotine to be more rapidly absorbed in the lungs and therefore affect the brain and central nervous system. Smoking causes lung cancer and a lot of other adverse health effects. Scientists demonstrate- Bro, it was a time in like America where smoking was cool, like athletes were smoking like after the games and like they had commercials and like it was a cool thing. It was not looked at as like nothing unhealthy at all. It, it was actually looked at as healthy, crazy demonstrated this definitively in the 1950s. However, public opinion wavered for decades, with sources springing up to generate controversy and debate. See, Some suspected smoking. that the tobacco industry was suppressing and distorting the facts through a coordinated campaign, and it eventually came out that they were. Mm. Together, the world's largest tobacco companies initiated Operation Berkshire to generate fake controversy and debate. 
Big Tobacco knew that smoking caused cancer and mm. that nicotine was addictive. That's crazy. They decided not to make cigarettes less harmful because addiction made them a lot of money. This is probably one of the mm. craziest conspiracy theories mm. that I have ever heard in my entire life. Everyone watching this right now, everybody you know, your parents, your family, your cousins, your aunts, your uncles, your friends is actually dead. No one is alive. But how is that possible, right? What? If everybody can feel pain, everybody can theoretically jump in front of a moving train, they can pinch themselves, they can hit themselves, they can inflict pain on others. How is it that we are all dead? So right. there are two well-known and documented things that we know happens to us after we are proclaimed clinically dead, meaning after the heart has stopped beating, right? Number one being that your whole life flashes right before your eyes and that's become cliche to say right you see it in movies you see it in cartoons you see it in novels and books whatever and number two being that your brain lives on for seven whole minutes after you've been proclaimed dead and in those seven minutes your brain is recreating memories in a dreamlike state and as einstein proclaimed time is relative right so time moves completely different for you when you're dead versus when you're alive. So those seven minutes for your brain after your death can vary anywhere from seven minutes to a hundred years. And it all feels what? real because you're living in a dreamlike state. And this theory claims that we all died in 2012 when the Mayans had predicted the end of the world and we all collectively died instantly and that now we are all experiencing life through a shared consciousness and that's why there's the mandela effect because we're all trying to come together and recreate these memories as best as we can on a collective consciousness level so some people will remember certain things what do y'all think about this this sounds crazy to me things as being a certain way and others will remember things being another way nothing is real no one is real everything is fake including me I don't know about that one, brother. 2012 came and went. It came and went. I think it's a little difficult to talk about Charles Manson without talking about his mother, Ada Kathleen Maddox. Kathleen, as she was known, was born on January 11th, 1919. She loved the loud music and all of the people who would dance and party with her. Charles Manson would go on to actually describe his mother as an alcoholic teenage runaway who engaged in sex work. She would mm. drop Charlie off with his grandmother and then go out with her brother, Luther Maddox, and rob patrons in bars by conning them. By mm. September 27th, 1939, Kathleen and her brother Luther are arrested for their involvement in what was called the ketchup bottle holdup. 10 years in Mansville State Penitentiary. And this penitentiary has since closed its doors mm. after being the site of 94 executions. Whoa. There were also a number of prison escapes at this specific prison, and one of them was none other than Luther Maddox himself, Kathleen's brother and wow. Charlie's uncle. Wow. Wow. 90 some executions. Think your ex is crazy? Wait till you hear this one. It's 2012 and Dave Krupa is a newly divorced father of two who just moved to Omaha, Nebraska to be near his kids who lived with their mother. Now that he's single and he's in a new city, he decides to join a dating site, Plenty of Fish. A day or two later, Dave gets a message from this woman, Liz Golier, and they hit it off. Immediately, Dave is attracted to Liz because they have a lot in common. They both love heavy metal, they both love motorcycles, and they both love animals. Liz, in fact, has two dogs, a cat, and a snake. So the two start dating, and even though he really likes her and he's attracted to her, he told her, I am in no rush to get into a relationship. I just got, you know, divorced, and let's just take this slow. And Liz mm -hmm. is like, no problem, totally cool. I'm the same way. Let's just casually date. So that's what they do. They casually date for weeks. One day, this woman, Carrie Farver, came into the mechanic shop that Dave worked at. He made a mental note that he thought she was super beautiful, but fixed her car and moved on with his life, thinking he would never see her or hear from her again. Okay. But as luck would have it, a few weeks later, he is scrolling through plenty of fish again, and lo and behold, he runs across Carrie's profile he shoots her a note and says hey like i know you and she responded and said i know you too and they end up meeting for drinks okay. the date went really well and just like dave and liz dave and carrie start a very casual relationship start dating and okay. he tells her the same thing i just got out of a divorce i am in no you know place in my life to have a real serious relationship and she just like Liz says the same thing no problem I'm totally cool with just casually dating and that's what they do for months 
So okay. one night, Carrie and Dave are at Dave's apartment just hanging out when there's a knock on the door, and it was Lids. Dave says, I'm sorry to both the women. I'm sorry. I know this is super awkward for both of you. Liz says, I'm sorry for interrupting. I literally just need to get something that she had left at Dave's house. So she grabs she it and him. leaves. Carrie at this point is, you know, a little whatever, taken aback, if you will, and leaves as well. So the two ladies sort of, you know, pass in the night and they both go to their respective homes. So one day while Dave's at work, he gets a text message from Carrie and she says like, hey, I have a crazy idea. We should move in together. And he kind of chuckles, but he's like, what are you talking about? We've already talked about this. You know how I feel about getting, you know, into a serious relationship. Like, where's this? Oh, hell no. Let's proceed. It's coming from. And Carrie gets super super pissed and responds what? pretty much saying screw you i want nothing to do with you like you're a jerk other choice words and that's that you uh, so dave is like whoa where did that come from you think you know somebody until you don't that type of thing and he decides he's not gonna see her anymore because she's like you yeah, know she gone a little bit crazy a little bit. So Dave lets it go, figures he'll just, you know, continue to date Liz and maybe keep looking at plenty of fish. But Carrie won't let this go. And what turned into, you know, a sort of annoying text grew into some super, super scary behavior. Hell nah. So she starts sending hundreds of messages, text messages to Dave on from her number. And then she starts getting, I don't know how she was doing it, but these random phone numbers that would text him hundreds of messages a day hundreds? just saying nasty, nasty things about him leaving her and breaking up and, you know, she's going to kill him. Like, just what? absurd. He said he couldn't block the numbers fast enough. She Whoa. would find a new number and send him the same text. Whoa. But then it escalated even Change further. Change your number. Next thing you know, Carrie's aggression is aimed at Liz, who at this point is... Like, just a random woman that Dave wow. is dating occasionally. And Carrie starts ripping into her. Same Whoa. thing. Hundreds and hundreds of texts a day threatening her, keying her car, what? breaking her windows at her home. What? Like, it starts escalating to a very scary level. At one point, Carrie even texts Liz and Dave pictures from inside Liz's home while she was at work. Like Bruh. super, super scary. What? She in behavior. the crib? For months this went on. Her Liz's car was being keyed. The windows were being broken at the house. Someone came in at one point and spray painted like horror on her um wall of her home. What? Like her home. Crazy. But it hit an all time high when Liz's home was burned to the ground. And not only that, thank God, her and her two kids weren't in the house, but her animals, her pets, the two dogs, the cat, and the snake were in the home when it burned. And Whoa. all of them, of course, died. Whoa. So, of course, now police are involved. And Liz and Dave both do the same thing. They are both so rattled and frightened that they decide to move. Liz doesn't tell Dave where she's moving, and right. Dave doesn't tell Liz where he's moving. They just right. pack up and and bounce move so police are to the point they know if they don't find carrie somebody is going to die a hundred percent she is going 100%. to end up killing someone Hell so nah. they take all these emails and text messages that dave and liz had received and try Hundreds. to search for the ip address it took months and months and months of time what? but eventually they locate an IP address in Council Bluffs, Iowa, that's registered to a man named Todd Butterboff. Now, police are absolutely shocked at this point because Todd Butterboff works ex. for the county that is investigating this entire situation. And not only that, he works directly under the IT guy who found the IP address of Carrie. What? So police know they need to tread very lightly, but they what? decide there's nothing else for them to do except for talk to Todd directly and be like, what, what? is going on? 
So they approach Todd and tell them what they know. And Todd says, I have no clue what you're talking about. Maybe you should talk to my girlfriend. She's been living oh, here for the last year or so. They're her? like, okay, is great. Who is your girlfriend? Carrie. So imagine how shocked police are when they learn that Todd's girlfriend is none other than Liz Golier. They continue what? their investigation and learn that every single text message, every single email, this has been thousands and thousands and thousands at this point. All that hate spewed at Liz and Dave had come directly from Liz, not what? Carrie. She burnt her In other out? words, Liz Golier had been impersonating Carrie Farver. What? Every email, every text, every smashed window, what? every keyed car, every spray painted wall had all been done by Liz herself. She burned her own Even creatures? Even the house that burned down with her own pets, her two dogs, her cat, and her snake. She did They it? were killed by Liz, their owner. At this point, police are almost certain that wow. Liz has murdered Carrie, and now they need to prove it. What? They end up finding a fingerprint of Liz's on a mint can, which was in the vehicle of Carrie Farver. Now, Carrie, all this time, police believed had been on the run since she had been messing with Liz and Dave for so long. So police had been unable to find Carrie. She now we know killed. it's because she was dead, not because wow. she had gone, you know, on the run. Wow. In another stroke of luck, Dave finds an old tablet that he had had at the time he was dating Liz and Carrie and turns it over to police. It is the diamond in the rough they needed. On the tablet is a picture of Carrie's dead foot. Liz had taken a picture of her victim after she had killed her. Police bring Liz in for questioning and eventually she admits to stabbing Carrie and then setting her body on fire. What? Liz is arrested and in August of 2017 sentenced to life in prison for first degree murder. Bro, what? That is the craziest Scale of 1 to 10, how crazy is that? Scale of 1 to 10, that's a 20 for me. This information comes directly from real police reports. When two officers get called to a possible break-in at a morgue, one night in Illinois, a police officer and his partner were working the night shift. A call came into dispatch saying there was a possible break-in at the morgue. They take these very seriously because of all the chemicals that could be of interest of drug dealers. The two officers head to the morgue and upon arrival, they find the custodian waiting for them outside. He told the officers that he saw someone run down the hallway and disappear into a room. Mm. But being alone and unarmed, he decided to call the police. Figuring it was some kids or the custodian was just making this up. The officers walked through the corridors with their hands on their guns, checking each room as they went. While one officer was searching the waiting room of the families of the deceased, he hears his partner call out, stop, turn around. He turned around to see his partner with his gun raised. He hollers out, she went around the corner. They knew that was a dead end. And knowing they had her trapped, mm -hmm. they, they saw her pretty clearly standing in front of a door. Now they knew exactly what she looked like. As soon as she realized they could see her, she ducked into a room and slammed the door shut behind her, locking it. The what? officer began banging on the door, hollering to the woman to come out and show herself. Just then the other officer and the custodian come running up. The custodian had this weird, scared look on his face when the police officer asked him, what's going on he said that door doesn't lock from the inside so what? the custodian unlocked the door and they all went in the officers reported how extremely cold the room was even for a morgue he then immediately turned on the lights revealing two autopsy tables in the center of the room of course they immediately noticed the body underneath the sheet after a quick search of the rest of the room they realized that that had to be her as they approached her they noticed an unearthly stench they describe it as a smell of rot and death when the officers pulled the sheet off the body, there lay the woman they'd been chasing through the building, complete with the toe tag that she had died four days earlier. What? 
What? What does that even mean? Because when conspiracy turns out to be true. says prestigious scientific journals only publish papers that fit the narrative. Anything besides doom and gloom, man-made global warming is left unpublished. This is because these studies are often bought and paid for by government grants and charitable foundations, both with political and financial interests in the global warming industry. And it is an industry. But do we really need solar panels, windmills, and electric cars if we can control the weather with laser beams? Instead of doing a rain dance, we physicists are firing trillion watt lasers into the sky to actually precipitate rain clouds and actually bring down lightning bolts. This is potentially a game changer. When you have water vapor and you have dust particles or ice crystals, you can... Man, people want to be God so bad. Like, they want to be God so bad, man. Precipitate rain. It condenses around the seeds. These seeds can also be created by laser beams. By firing trillion watt lasers, you rip apart the electrons, creating what are called ions. And these ions act like seeds, like dust particles, bringing down rain and even lightning. So instead of controlling the narrative, we can just control the weather. Mm. Theoretical physicist Dr. Michio Kaku joins me now. So, Doctor, has the U.S. government been experimenting with weather control? Believe it or not, the answer is yes. People don't realize that, well, as Mark Twain said, everyone complains about the weather, but no one ever does anything about it. Well, the government takes exception to that. During the Vietnam War, there was something called Operation Popeye, a top secret program to seed the clouds over Vietnam during the monsoon season to wash the Viet Cong out. Wow. Ooh. And they actually tried that. They with tried. laser beams? Well, no, with silver iodide crystals oh. to condense the water vapor to cause nuclei that would then cause raindrops and that would then accelerate the monsoon season. Mm. Okay. So are they doing this today, the U.S. government? Well, it turns out that eight states in the United States uh, practice some form of weather modification. What? For example, seeding the clouds with silver iodide. And the Chinese, famously at the Olympic in the year 2008, seeded the clouds in order to have it rain outside of the Olympics. <laughs> wow. So, Did it work? Uh, apparently, yeah. The, the, wow. And so is it just China and the United States trying to control the weather? No, uh, many, many countries have, have some kind of weather modification program because the economy, trade, uh, war, everything is dependent upon the weather, if you think mm. about it, right? So can we mm. make things less hot because it was a hot summer? Well, believe it or not, in Dubai, they actually have a laser system based on drones that go into the clouds and fire a laser beam, which, quote, electrifies the air, and these ions then form nuclei for raindrops. Oh. And it accelerates rain in the Middle East. That they get four <laughs> inches of rain per year in Dubai. All right. can't be so I can just shoot a laser in the sky and not have to buy a Tesla? Well, in the United States now, we're also t experimenting with terawatt lasers. These Ooh. are trillion watt lasers. They're pulsed. They, they produce more energy in a split second than all the nuclear power plants on the planet Earth. What? However, it's only for a brief second of time. But in that <laughs> brief second of time, you ionize and electrify the weather so that you get raindrops. All right. After COVID, this sounds a little risky, but I'm sure Joe Biden has it perfectly under control. <laughs> Thank you, doctor. Bruh, that can't be healthy for the people, though. Can't be. Hey guys, we're Dark Times, and here are three conspiracy theories you didn't know were true. Number one, the conspiracy that some of the art we see in museums isn't real actually has some truth to it. A study by The Independent found 20% of art museums is fake, and in some instances, mm. artifacts are found to be fake or unreal. They're kept on display, either because it's a popular piece or they just use it as a visual representation of that era. Number right. two, the conspiracy theory that the government is spying on its citizens? Definitely true. News reports as far back as 2005 show that the NSA is spying on us, monitoring our phone calls and internet communication. This is Edward Edward Snowden. In 2013, he blew the government surveillance program PRISM wide open, which is a secret espionage program run by the NSA. They use this program to monitor all of our digital communication. Number three, the conspiracy that secret societies, namely the Illuminati, run the government from behind the scenes might actually have some truth to it. Illuminati dates back to the 1700s. It was named the Bavarian Illuminati. The Illuminati was banned in 1785 by the Duke at that time, but they were able to co-mingle with the Freemasons, a group that's made up of a lot of powerful people. What's really interesting, go to your search bar and type in Illuminati backwards. It brings you right to the NSA website. What? 
Somebody do that in the comments and let me know is that real. Let me know in the comments. Mind control. What if I told you that in 1953, the US CIA used high doses of psychoactive drugs such as LSD and other chemicals along with various forms of torture, including electroshock, sensory deprivation, and sexual abuse on innocent subjects without consent. What? To develop procedures that could be used during interrogations to weaken people and force confessions. You may have heard of MK Ultra, a completely illegal and inhumane project that for years was considered a crazy conspiracy theory, mm. but today is known to be 100% true. Wow. Wow. Without people consent, bro. If you like paranormal shit, listen to what just happened to me and my husband. So we're sitting at the table eating dinner, right? And our window's open because we have Siberian Huskies. It's cold out. They force us to open the window. They're like bullies, but nonetheless. Window's open. We're eating, we're sitting, and all of a sudden, the dogs are pop up and they're both by the window. And that doesn't happen. These dogs could literally, somebody could be breaking in the house and taking all my shit and they would not even give a singular fuck. That's just how huskies are. So we're like, okay, well, what the fuck is out this window, right? So me and my husband are like kind of just like looking and I say to the dogs, obviously not thinking I'm gonna get an answer. Hey, who do you guys say? And I kid you not, we hear a voice that I've never heard before. It sounded like a child's voice say, It's me, bitch. It better fucking not be. I don't want no. It better not be you. My husband runs downstairs, gets his gun. I start backing away from the window because I'm like, I don't care who it is. Window. Like, I don't, I, no, no, thank you. Ew. He goes outside, scopes out the area. We have a camera, nothing on the camera, nobody in the yard. We have a fence in yard. Like, I. No. It's me. Hell nah. You I want to tell this window. ghost story for years. I just never got around to it. This is actually my mother's story, but she's too afraid to talk about it 20 years later. So I had to learn about this through my dad. I am from the Big Island of Hawaii. Okay. And this story takes place right here on a road from Lapakahi State Park all the way up north to where I'm from called North Kohala, Hawaii. And for further context, Lapakahi State Park is a ancient Hawaiian fishing village that was preserved by the state of Hawaii and made into a national park. If you ask anyone from North Kohala all the way down to Kauai High, everyone has a ghost story about Lapakahi, and mm. this is my mom's. When I was a kid, my mother mm. used to work three jobs, and one of them was in Waikoloa Village, which is where all the tourist resorts are. Mom had been awake for 36 hours straight and was extremely tired and finally had a day off from work, Damn. so she started driving home. Of course, after working almost 36 hours straight at 36. three different jobs, she was extremely tired and falling asleep behind the wheel. We were swerving in and out of lanes, um, falling asleep behind the wheel, being woken up by going off of the road into the dirt. But Damn. again, she worked three jobs just to support me being the one-year-old baby. So she wanted to get home to me because she hasn't seen me in three days. She continued swerving in and out of traffic, falling asleep behind the wheel until she passed Lapakahi State Park. Now this happens sometime between two and three o'clock in the morning, so mm. it's extremely dark outside. So when she fell asleep once again behind the wheel, she woke up immediately because she felt something else in the car with her. Out of her peripherals, she noticed a massive Hawaiian man sitting in her car in the passenger seat what? with his arms crossed and looking straight forward. She was so terrified. She did not look over at him at all, but she what? did note that he was extremely massive. Ancient Hawaiians sometimes got between six, eight and seven foot tall, about 300 pounds of nothing but muscle. The drive from Lapakahi State Park Hell all the way to where I'm from, exactly my house, takes about 20 minutes. So for 20 minutes, she sat in the car with the ancient Hawaiian man doing nothing but staring straight forward. After a couple minutes, she realized that this man was not there for any sinister purposes. He was there to try and protect her wow. from herself. So wow. as she became more comfortable, she became more sleepy. And she said every time she would start to shut her eyes and drift off to one side of the road, that entire side of the road would light up like a road flare. Mm. He sat in the car until they parked the car. And when my mom turned to thank him, he was gone. He immediately ran into the house crying and screaming, went to the phone and immediately called her boyfriend, now my stepdad and her husband to explain what had happened. Explained to her that his last name, Kahalia Umi, means the protectors of Umi. 
and mm-hmm. Umi was the high chief somewhere around the coast that she was driving at. And more than likely, that was Umi, our chief ancestor, who was there watching over my mother that night. Wow. If you're ever wondering why us Hawaiians have wow. such respect for our ancestors, that's why. Wow. Wow, that's powerful. That's Tell powerful. me, what's the creepiest experience you ever had in your life and why you still think about that moment? This is a funny, funny, funny Beyonce and Jay-Z story. Check this wow. out. A while back, a buddy of mine was bodyguarding Beyonce at a 4040 event in New York City. As you guys know, Jay-Z owned the club, the 4040 in New York. Anyway, he was bodyguarding Beyonce for about five or six hours, man. He had her all night. Basically, him and another one of his buddies was protecting her. Anyway, he's standing on the dance floor while Beyonce's dancing. Ashanti's there. All right, Carrie is there. It's a star-studded event. The place is packed. While Beyonce was dancing, a fight broke out on the dance floor. Not with none of the celebrities, just regular people fighting on the dance floor. My buddy grabs Beyonce, picks her up, and tosses her over his shoulder like a rag doll. My boy was pretty big. He was like 6'2", like 260 pounds. He was pretty, a pretty big dude. He grabs Beyonce, throws her over his shoulder, and rushes her back to a secure area. Now, Jay-Z gets word of the, the fight, he goes back to the room to see if Beyonce is okay. But meanwhile, my boy didn't know that Jay-Z peeped that he was carrying Beyonce to the back area. Now, apparently, Jay-Z wasn't too happy with that. Mm. The door was cracked, and my boy heard Jay-Z spazzing on Beyonce. Oh, so I guess you like, you know, that's the way that dude was carrying you, right? So that dude was, you like that, huh? She goes, what are you talking about? Right. He did his job. He's protecting me. What, you want me to get hurt? Jay-Z was like, nah, nah, he didn't have to grab you like that. He wasn't feeling that. So he made a call to, I guess, the head of security of the club, and they replaced my boy, man. Jay-Z was, like, super jealous of my homie, bro. It's crazy. He had him replaced just because he didn't like the way he carried Beyonce to the back room during a scuffle. He was protecting your wife, bro. Relax. You ain't got to be that jealous. She ain't going nowhere, bro. Yo, but he was definitely tripping over my homie. I don't know if he thought Beyonce was feeling the bro or what. But that definitely happened. Jay-Z was super jealous. He was not having my boy protecting Beyonce. Anyway, get in the comments, man. Let's chop it up. Was Jay-Z overreacting or or did he do the right thing? Man, it all depends on how he was carrying her, man. You know what I'm saying? Because some of those security guards be trying to be slick and trying to grab ass and trying to, you know what I'm saying? So it all depends, bro. All depends. The creepiest moment that I ever had had to be probably when I was like 19, 20 years old. After a long night of partying, you know, drinks, you know, hanging with friends, I'm getting in my car and I heard a loud scream. I ain't think nothing of it. Shit, people scream all the time. Now, what shit got crazy at is when I pull up to the house and I hit a loud scream as I'm getting out the car. So what? at this point, I'm like, damn, maybe I'm just drunk. You know, maybe I might be too drunk. My ears just ringing, you know, something of the sort. So I walk in the house and as I'm walking in the house, I feel like chills up my spine. So at this point, you know, I'm making up every excuse like, damn, it might be just a little cold. You know, I might be just too fucking drunk. So as yeah, I'm walking man. in the house, I close the door. And as I'm locking the door, I hear a loud scream. But this time it sounds like it's coming from the driveway. So only thing I could do is just stand there. You know, I was scared to move. So when the screaming stopped, probably after like two or three seconds, I'm like, man, I need to go lay down. You know, I probably might be just too drunk. Somebody probably slipped something in my drink or something. My head all fucked up. You know, I'm scared at this point. So I go to sleep so fast. So the next morning when I see my mom, so the next morning when I see my mom, she tell me, hey, don't be playing outside my house doing all that loud ass screaming and shit mm. at two or three o'clock in the morning. I ain't even want to tell her because I know ain't nobody going to believe me, no nothing. Right. But to this day, I promise to you, I never walk in no dark places without cutting on the light first, not even my own house. We're asleep and she gets up to go to the bathroom and I'm like, oh man, I have to go to the bathroom too. So I'm going to go to the bathroom in the, the main bathroom right. outside the room. I, was, I, was I go out, I come back in and I'm like, why'd you turn my light on? On my side of the bed, like are we get it's twelve. We're going to bed, like we're in bed. She's like, I didn't do it. I thought you did. I'm like, okay, well somebody's trying to get our attention. My phone rings. It's my little sister. She says, "Hey, Bob, sorry, are you awake?" And I'm like, 
I am now. <laughs> I go, my light just came on. She goes, that's why I was calling you. Mm -hmm. She said, is Nicole there? I'm like, yeah. She put her on speaker. She said, Nicole, I don't want to get personal, but um, did your mom have miscarriages before, before you? Mm. And she's like, yeah. She goes, I'm seeing three people in the room right now trying to get your attention. Mm. And they're your, they're your two brothers and your sister that weren't born. Wow. Wow. Celebrities that see spirits. I personally know you put the work in. Yeah, but so, um, I In his great song, Walking in Memphis, there's a pretty little... What the hell? Tell me, what's the creepiest experience you ever had in your life? So I work in advertising where we produce and shoot commercials for various clients. Um, one of the commercials we were working on required a set that looked like a 1980s Irani hospital. And we're, we're Utah based, so that's something that's really hard to find here. Luckily, our mm. producer tracked down this old, it had been an old nursing home and a mental hospital back in the day, and it was no longer in use. It was really old and kind of grungy looking. It was perfect. We, we go there, and as soon as I walk through the door, I just feel this bad vibe, like in the pit of my stomach. I just felt gross. It was just this weird energy in that building, mm. and... <laughs> It's kind of funny because our, our art director walked in the door. Well, this isn't funny. But as soon as he walks in, he just throws up all over the place. And I don't know if he had been sick before. Wow. But he wow. was definitely extremely sick in that building. He ended up curling up on an old hospital bed and just throwing up the rest of the day. I actually had to go wow. buy him a bucket um, because he was so sick. He probably should have gotten the heck out of that place. Right. But I think he was, he was too sick to, to drive even. I felt so bad. Um, anyway, on our lunch break, I was talking to our hair and makeup lady and she knew a little bit more about the building because I, I went in completely blind and she was like, yeah, a lot of weird things have, have been known to happen here and there's, there's a lot of weird stuff in here. There's supposedly this old electro shock therapy chair in the basement and mm. I was like, oh, I want to go see the electric chair in the basement. That sounds like a fun adventure. Who the hell would say that? Who the hell would be like, oh, I want to go see that in the you know, and being being naive um, and just wanting a thrill, I was like, oh, let's go explore. And we had the whole building locked down for Hell ourselves. No. There was no one else but our film crew there. So together we just kind of go prancing through the hallways, looking in rooms, and we get to the edge of this really long hallway that's completely covered in a green carpet. And she goes, oh my gosh, this is called the Green Mile. I've heard of this. And I'm like, what's the Green Mile? And she said, it's, it's the hallway where they used to wheel patients out to surgery. And there's a lot of stories about this hallway. And as soon as we're standing there, she all of a sudden just freezes and like looks down into the abyss of the hallway, you know, towards the end. And I follow her gaze and this door comes open Ooh. and this huge figure just glides across the hallway and it's completely black. It's kind of like distorted, oblong, humanoid, but bulbous. Its head was like kind of bulbous and it just glides across the carpet, goes into this other door and that door just slams shut. I'm in complete shock. Um, we are just staring frozen. Yeah, you ain't prancing no more. Down this hallway. And I'm going to have to do part two. Sorry, guys. She wasn't prancing no more. All that shit went out the window. Here's a crazy celebrity moment you forgot happened. We really just let Woody Allen marry his stepdaughter. When Mia Farrow and Woody Allen got together, she had seven children from a previous relationship. Three were adopted and one was a girl named Soon Yi. Allegedly, when she was 21 and Woody was 56, they started getting oddly close and eventually sleeping together behind Mia's back. What? A month later, Mia found nude photos of Soon Yi in Woody's apartment. And when confronted, he professed his love for her. By December of 1997, they were married and they're still together to this day. What? <laughs> what? 
Man, have you ever heard of what the everybody is dead theory? Oh, the all of us are dead or no, everyone? Everybody is dead theory. I think have I heard have. About that? Tell me. So there's a theory, right? Yeah. You know how the world was supposed to end in like 2012? 20, yeah, 2012. Oh, everybody was like, oh, fuck, we're going to die, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's a theory uh -huh. that we actually all did die in 2012 yeah. and life right now. Right? You know how people say when they die, uh -huh. their life flashes before their eyes, mm -hmm. but to them, it flashes and it's almost like they perceive time differently. Oh yeah. So what if everybody died in 2012 <laughs> yeah. and we're all experiencing life through a flash, mm. right? But this flash feels like however long, 80 years, right? Yeah. But really, it's just happening within like a millisecond. Within a millisecond, yeah. And then somebody's like presses the button and where we just all wake up yeah. to nothing. Yo, there's this crazy TikTok I saw too. Okay. So there's this there's this lady, she was talking about how I don't know if I believe that, y'all. Keep it Was Kobe Bryant's death planned four years before it happened? In 2016, a Comedy Central cartoon named Legends of Chamberlain Heights aired an episode where Kobe Bryant died in a helicopter crash. The second prediction of Kobe Bryant's death also happened in 2016 at his last basketball game. In that game, fans sitting courtside received a goodie bag that also included a Kobe Bryant toy that turned into a helicopter. That's insane. Kobe died in a helicopter crash in 2020. Are we living in a simulation? Was this some crazy coincidence or was this foreshadowing? I don't know about the toy, but that cartoon was crazy. Let me explain the eyes wide shut conspiracy theory. So it's well known that the cut presented a few days before Kubrick's death was too jarring for executives that they cut 25 minutes out without Kubrick there to oppose the decision. Mm. This left many storylines seemingly unresolved, so we're not really sure if the story is actually what was intended. The crazy thing is, is that they asked Kubrick to cut the scenes before he died and he said no. So the conspiracy is that he made a movie about this sensitive subject of exposing the elites, refused to cut the touchy scenes when asked, died a few days later only to have the studio cut the scenes mm. anyways. Mm. It's a conspiracy, but it really makes you think. Mm. 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 This was a conspiracy theory for a while, mm -hmm. but it turned out to be real. There's this project, I think it's called the Manhattan Project, yeah. but yeah. Fuck, it wasn't called the Manhattan Project, it was something else. Yeah. Damn, yo, leave in the yeah. comments what it is. Uh -huh. But pretty much what they did, Germany scientists, mm -hmm. like the ones that worked on special weapons and all of these biological products, what they did, they made a treaty with the United States to, I guess, use their creations and experiments and their studies and be pardoned for what they for what they did in the war. Mm -hmm. And they really did that. I think they yeah. got sent to, fuck, I totally forgot like exactly where, mm -hmm. but there's a facility in the States that like housed all of the Nazi experiments and they used the tech for them. Yeah. They literally used the tech for all of these different, I guess like weaponry, uh, medicines. Yeah. And I think there's, there's certain medicines that wouldn't even been created if not for the war. Mm. And we can thank for like to this day. I wouldn't be surprised. I so I found surprised. these conspiracy theories that are so believable, they actually might be true. Number one, studies show that cats understand human commands but don't care to follow them. Yeah, <laughs> I don't funny. like cats. That's I'm funny. a dog kind of guy. Number two, it is believed that when you die in a dream, you wake up because your brain doesn't know how to process the idea of what comes after death. Wow. Could be. I believe it. Number three, now this is Carrie. The reason Disney came out with a movie called Frozen was so that when you googled Disney Frozen, you would get information about the movie and not the websites talking about Walt Disney's body being frozen. I mean, I did see an article about this that was published in 1995. I'm not sure if this is true or not, but I do believe it. This is where it gets freaky. Number four, Mike Tyson's fight, Time Traveler. This fight was in 1995. If you look closely, you can see that that could be a smartphone. 
In fact, it does look like a smartphone what? to me. There were no smartphones in uh, 1995. What? This is how phones used to look like in 1995. They didn't have cameras. They barely had any color. But this thing double flashed. Exactly like how an iPhone or an Android would take a picture. I gotta see I that. I don't know about time travel, but this is very interesting. I'd really like to know what this thing was. What's the creepiest it. conspiracy theory that you heard of? Time travel? I don't know about that. I gotta see the footage. Another day, another conspiracy that is turning out to be true. You see, we all kind of know that Western media is very pro the country that shall not be named. But now billionaires feel the need to put their thumb on the scale even more. This is from Semaphore, reports of billionaires discussing a $50 million anti-Hamas media blitz. Quote, mm. Wall Street and Hollywood billionaires have discussed in recent weeks a plan to spend as much as $50 million on a media campaign to define Hamas to the American people as a terrorist organization. First off, wow. I don't know why they feel the need to do this. The U.S. State Department designated Hamas a foreign terrorist organization back in October of 1997. Real estate billionaire Barry Sternlich launched the campaign in the days after the October 7th attacks on the country that shall not be named, and in an email viewed by Semaphore, sought $1 million donations each from dozens of the business world's wealth people. Remember our old friend Barry, he's the one wishing for a nice little recession to get the workers back in the line. Yep, that same guy. Anyway, Sternlich wrote that he's trying to raise $50 million from the group and seek a matching donation from a large Jewish charity for a media blitz to quote unquote define Hamas as not just the enemy of the country that shall not be named, but also of the United States. Public opinion will surely shift as scenes, real or fabricated by Hamas, of civilian Palestinian real suffering will surely erode the country that shall not be named, current empathy in the world community, he wrote. We must get ahead of this narrative. He also wrote that he'd had a great conversation about the effort with CNN owner David Zasloff. Oh my God, manufacturing consent used to be this thing that they did quietly behind closed doors and we kind of all had to connect the dots on our own. Right. Now it's so brazen, billionaires saying the quiet part out loud, we're losing control of this narrative. Let me get the head of CNN on the phone. We gotta get ahead of this narrative. Crazy. Here we are. Crazy, crazy, man. Here are three more conspiracies that turned out to be true. This first one is on the tobacco lobby. Since the 1950s, doctors had evidence that tobacco was terrible for your health. The big tobacco lobby and tobacco companies actually lobbied against this, though, um, and for many years, telling the public that smoking was actually good for you. Told because you. of this, public opinion had wavered considerably on the health benefits of smoking. Eventually in the 90s that had come out that big tobacco companies actually knew that it was harmful for human health um, but suppressed information anyway. Number two, false justification for war. Mm. On August 7th, 1964, the USS Maddox approached the Gulf of Tonkin and fired a warning shot. After firing the warning shot, it turned out that it had sank uh, three Vietnamese warships. What? Despite this, a few days later, a report of a second attack was launched. This prompted then-President Lyndon B. Johnson to launch a second series of attacks in Vietnam. It was later revealed that the second report attack was imaginary and it never happened. Number three, Scientologists have infiltrated the government. In the 1970s, at least 5,000 organization members had conducted espionage on U.S. government institutions and private corporations. L. Ron Hubbard's wife, Mary Sue Hubbard, even herself pleaded guilty to these accusations of espionage. She did eventually uh, go to prison for that. Mm. That tobacco shit was foul, bro. What's a conspiracy theory that you a thousand percent believe in? I'll go first. I believe wholeheartedly that we are living life at different times. Mm. Let me explain. So when you go to sleep, right, you wake up almost immediately, right? Since you went to sleep, you are already on to the next day. If I was over at your house and I stayed up all night, that means I'm leaving all that time. By the time you wake up in my time, you're already going to be a few hours into the day in your time. See what I'm saying? No. That means something that you're going through already happened to someone else. You just don't know because you're only living in your time. Mm. I get it, but I don't get it at the same time. What's a coincidence that you think about a lot? Do I have a crazy story for this? 
So it's 1997 and I'm just at its college uh, in the small town in France. And this guy showed up in a friend circle. He showed up from Paris, stayed four months in that town and left again. I could not stand him. Him and I Damn. almost got into a fight, like a physical fight one night. Wow. We did not get along. Not sure why, but couldn't stand him. Anyway, life goes on. He goes back to Paris. Never heard from him again. Never saw him again. Life goes on. We moved to the state. Then moved to New Orleans. Fast forward, it's 2008. Now we have a kid who's going to kindergarten. Pre-K or kindergarten. Anyway, the kid keeps coming home saying, Oh, my best friend, Elan. This, my best friend, Elan, that. And his daddy's French. And his uh -oh. daddy's from Paris. Uh-oh. That I'm like, hmm. And one day we're waiting at the outside of the school in New Orleans. Oh, I know. And who do we I see? The guy. He had married a girl from New Orleans. Crazy. Moved, <laughs> had two kids. Crazy. His kids was named Elan. My kid is named Elzian. Super close. Same. They had the same same class. They were in the same class, but wait, they were the same age, almost to the T. Wow. They had, they're 10 days apart. Wow. And so just because my kid was 10 days overdue. And wow. that was it. So, I mean, this is a crazy story. How did this happen in the whole world? <laughs> How did we end up living next to each other? In the whole 10, world. 10,000 miles away. And having kids the same age in the same class with the same, almost the same first name. Crazy. How? Anyway. It's fine. We, we never fought again or whatever. Uh, my husband and him became kind of buddies. Wow. And they're still in touch and the kids are gone, but, um, the kids stay friends for a long time. And anyway, you know that wine? Small world. I swear to you, this world is small. Crazy. Anyway, that's the story. One of the scariest true stories I've ever heard. Back on October 17, 1941, police found the lifeless body of 73-year-old Philip Peters inside his Denver, Colorado home. He'd been bludgeoned with an iron rod. What? Strangely, all the doors and windows in the house were locked and there were no signs of forced entry. While this was going on, Peters' wife had been in the hospital recuperating from a broken hip. She returned to her now-empty house along with a housekeeper to help care for her. Over time, both women became increasingly terrified as they began to hear strange noises throughout the house in the middle of the night. Eventually, the housekeeper quit because she was convinced the house was haunted. Mm. Mrs. Peters soon abandoned the house as well. She moved in with her son in western Colorado. This left the house empty, or so they thought. Over time, neighbors began complaining to police that strange things continued to occur inside the house. Movement could be seen from inside, and sometimes lights would click on in the middle of the night. Police staked the home out. Then on July 30th, 1942, one of them noticed some movement inside the house. They burst in and ran upstairs to the attic just in time to see a pair of skinny legs sliding inside a tiny trap door. Police what? reached in and dragged out a skeletally thin homeless man named Theodore Edward Conies. The 59-year-old Canadian immigrant had broken into the house weeks earlier and found a tiny trap door in the attic that would have been too narrow for any normal-sized man but not for someone as scrawny as he was. Coney's had been living inside the house completely unbeknownst to Mr. and Mrs. Peters. That is, until one night when Mr. Peters caught him downstairs stealing food from the fridge. Ooh. After that, an altercation ensued, and Coney's beat the life out of the old man. Wow. It was because of Coney's narrow stature that the press dubbed him the Denver Spider-Man. So the next time you hear a strange noise inside your house, you might want to check to make sure you really are truly alone. This Hell girl got no. so angry that she decapitated her own mother. You're not going to want to miss this case. It's insane. Hi, I'm Meg. I talk about your crime. Let's get into it. I was so heated up with anger. I just kept stabbing and stabbing and stabbing her. And I, I, I took off her head. This all takes place in Australia in 2019. What? Rita Calamari was a woman who loved her kids with her whole heart. She was described as having a heart of gold, but one of her biggest difficulties in life was handling her daughter, Jessica. Mm. Jessica was developmentally delayed. She was diagnosed with autism, 
and a disorder that was called innate explosive rage disorder, Whoa. which led Jessica to having really huge outbursts of anger. Wow. Rita had other kids, but they had all moved out by this point, and she was actually divorced from her husband, so in the home, it was just her and Jessica. Mm. Rita was really determined to help Jessica get better mm. and to just help her live a good life. I forgot to mention, Rita was 57 and her daughter Jessica was 25 in 2019 when the story happens. Jessica was known to fixate on things intensely. One of Jessica's main fixations were horror movies. She loved Hell them. Hell no. Nah. Texas Chainsaw Massacre was one of these you films can't watch that, that she shit. really loved. No. And she apparently would just watch the gory scenes on repeat. You need to watch like the passion of christ not even that don't watch that because that shit get crazy too watch like the little mermaid you know what i'm saying like you can't you fixating on that stuff you can't nah she wouldn't watch them though like with a feeling of disgust she seemed to watch them with a feeling of fascination another huge fixation that jessica had was numbers she would fixate on a certain set of numbers and jumble them around to create phone numbers she would mm. call these numbers over and over and over again. And when the person on the other end of the phone would get like annoyed or talk back to her, she would threaten to cut their heads off. Whoa. She was said to say really disturbing things to these strangers she had randomly called. Rita tried to get Jessica's psychiatric help on many, many occasions. Jessica had been on different medications. She had even spent time in a psychiatric unit, but mm. nothing ever seemed to help her. In 2019, Jessica had returned home after spending time in a psychiatric facility oh, and shit. she started completely refusing to take any medication and she continued harassing people over the phone as she was doing before. She was acting out, but this time she had taken it to a whole new level. But Rita, despite this, kept trying with Jessica. On the 20th of July, 2019, Rita was not only looking after Jessica, but also her grandson. He oh, was only shit. four years old. One thing about Jessica is she really did not like when her mother gave attention to anybody else. Uh -oh. On this day, she had several loud outbursts towards this four-year-old boy, but her level of rage on this particular day was worse than Rita had ever seen. Mm. Rita tried calling Jessica's doctor, but Jessica full on refused to see him. Eventually, Rita just threatened Jessica saying, fine, like if you won't talk to your doctor, I will call an ambulance to come and get you. Uh -oh. As Rita went to pick up the home phone, Jessica grabbed it out of her hand. So Rita was like, fine, and went to get her cell phone. But like I said, Jessica had reached a level of rage she had never experienced before. So she went after her mother, grabbed her by the hair, and dragged her into the kitchen. Oh, snap. She then grabbed a knife and started stabbing her mother multiple, multiple times. Mm -hmm. She did it with such intensity that she broke some of the knives. What? And so she would grab a new one and just keep going. Jessica stabbed Rita over a hundred times. Whoa. Now, this is already quite gory as it is, but huge trigger warning it gets so much worse i'm trying to describe this in a way that won't get this video taken down but she um removed her mother's head and her tongue and her eyes and parts of her nose and to make it even like more heartbreaking that four-year-old boy then walks in Ooh. and sees this and that poor boy put himself between rita and jessica which is so, like, unbelievably brave for, like, a four-year-old to do. Jeez. I don't know what I would have done at that age. Probably just run away. But Jessica then slashed him in the face. And he ran away. Whoa. Jessica then took Rita's head and brought it outside. And then she went to the neighbor's house to call the police. And this is the strangest phone call I have ever heard. I'll let you listen from police emergency we just received a call from this number uh yes i need you to get the ambulance and the police out here immediately when things been going for months and months anyway um she she had enough of me she grabbed me by the hair and dragged me from my room all the way to the kitchen and she got a knife and she tried to stab me with it and i grabbed the knife off her because i thought she was going to stab me so i stabbed her back and i was so heated up with anger i just kept stabbing and stabbing and stabbing her and i i, I took off her head mm -mm. Yeah. 
So that's the phone call. So she claims that her mother was the one attacking her, but the crime scene says otherwise. And the thing that makes this whole thing very strange is that in the phone call, she's basically saying that she's not really sure if her mom's alive or not, when like, it's pretty obvious that she's not alive. I think that Jessica, she was very, very unwell. And that's what like caused this, obviously, like, mentally mm. she she was not okay because i'm sorry but there was no question on whether or not rita was alive after this incident mm. like you heard me describe what she did to her despite all that uh jessica claimed that it was self-defense mm. and she also asked them if a doctor could reattach her mother's head just that comment in itself shows that she was clearly very unwell Jessica was charged with manslaughter and given 21 years in prison. And I was a bit confused when I heard that as well, but she was given manslaughter because she was not mentally sound when she committed this murder. And something that's really bothered me about this whole case is that Jessica's in prison right now. She's not in a mental institution. And like, yes, what she did was horrific and it's ruined a lot of people's lives, but... She should be in a mental facility, not in a prison, in my personal opinion. The police on the case said that this was one of the most horrific crime scenes they had ever seen. Mm. If you're wondering about the boy, the four-year-old boy who was there, he was taken to a hospital and he was as okay as he could have been considering the situation. He was slashed in the face, but he did survive. Mm. Like I said, Jessica was given 21 years in prison. Um... I guess we'll see what happens after those 21 years, but Jeez. hopefully she's not just released. Hopefully she gets a lot of help. I don't know about you, but 21 years does not feel like enough time, especially because she's not in a mental institution. That's just like really concerning. I hope they don't just like let her out after 21 years. Mm. I can't imagine how Jessica's siblings are feeling like she killed their mother and harmed their son slash nephew. This case is just absolutely insane. Um, I would love to hear what you guys think about it because I have no words. All right, so that was scary, creepy, true TikTok, bruh. That last one was... It was another story that was like a scale of 1 to 10. It was like a 15, 20. That was 100. That was crazy. Like I said, man, if you made it to the end of this one, you a real one, for real. Drop real one for real in the comments. That was crazy. Also, like I say, if y'all wanna tap into more, I got a playlist of these TikTok reactions where you could just binge watch it and just have your mind blown. But till next time, man, like I always say, self-love and positivity. Fire Squad, I got you and you know it. Hey.